Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Vazadin. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. I am so excited to bring back Dr. Shannon Clark to talk to us about pregnancy after 40 from preconception to delivery. Welcome back, Shannon. Thank you for having me. I'm going to share with our followers. A lot of people obviously already know you, but let me just share a little bit about you. You're a double board certified OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist focusing on the care of women with maternal and or fetal complications of pregnancy. After finishing After finishing medical school at the University of Louisville School of Medicine in Louisville, Kentucky, you completed a residency in OBGYN at Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And during your first year of residency, you realized your passion for taking care of women with complicated or high-risk pregnancies and subsequently pursued a fellowship in maternal fetal medicine and also received a master's in medical science at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas. You're an associate professor with roles as a clinician. Well, I'm, no, wait, wait, I'm a professor. I got, I got promoted. <laughs> Yay, congratulations. Oh, that's huge. Well, it's been, it's been a couple of years. Yes, okay. Oh, that's awesome. You also had <laughs> twins at the age of 43, and you run the popular Babies After 35 account on Instagram and TikTok Baby Doc on TikTok. Welcome back. Thank you for coming back on the show. Thank you. So you recently co-authored this fabulous paper. And when I read it, I was like, oh my God, I have to have Shannon on the show. And it's titled Pregnancy After 40 Recommendations for Counseling, Evaluation, and Management from Preconception to Delivery. And there's a lot of ground to cover here. What set the ball in motion for you and your co-authors to write the paper? Well, one of my residents is going into REI and he is incredible. Um, Very good writer. Uh, I'm not so bad myself, but um, I've always wanted to do something like that. And, and being in academic medicine, whenever there's something I want to write about, I always author, offer to give primary authorship uh, and have the residents or fellows do it because they need the publications. So um, Christopher uh, joined me and did a lot of work with our now PGY2. She was a medical student at the time, and now she's a PGY2. And um, so we co authored the paper together. We also added on Christopher's dad, who is an REI. Uh, to get the the you know board certified o, uh, REI on board, but it ended up being a really good paper, and they made it a, a continuing med- medical education paper, which I thought was excellent. So um, the providers that read it can answer questions and get some CME credits. So that's kind of how it got started. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to put you on the spot for a second here. What do you think is the age where you would say you're too old? To have a baby, I, mean, I don't. I I don't know. I I don't think that's up to anyone to decide, but the individual individual themselves. I mean, I I think probably the older someone is, you have to think about your longevity and what you know what might happen. Now, of course, anybody their longevity can be cut short at any point in time, but I, I think the you know when you start pressing past fifty, I think that's probably the biggest con- uh, consideration. Assuming that you're physically well enough and healthy enough to uh, undergo a pregnancy. Um, but I do think that's a legitimate concern. And even at 42, almost 43, when I had my twins, I kind of, I still kind of worry about that a little bit. Um, but I don't think it's up to anyone to judge. I really don't. Uh, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. Someone asked me that question today. I was giving a talk to an MBA program and I literally said, if you think you're too old, you're too old. And who am I to judge? That was like word for word my answer. So that's fun to hear you say that. So advanced maternal age is defined as pregnancy over 35. And we've talked about pregnancy after 35 together and in previous recordings that we've done. So what should be included in preconception counseling after 40? So I think one of the big things to consider is uh, one of the things that actually prompted me to want to do this paper is that more and more individuals are delaying childbearing. And rightfully so. We have people that are not putting, you know, becoming a parent first. And I think that's perfectly fine. People have the right to pursue education and training. Um, But you also had to be knowledgeable about the potential implications of delaying childbearing. So if anyone is approaching age 40, especially if someone has never had a child before, 
incorporating that discussion into any, you know, your yearly OBGYN visit or gynecologic visit about your plans. I, you know, I think the provider should bring it up. We're not quite there yet. It's not included in our boxes for a well woman exam yet. It probably should be. Um, but if not, then the, the, the patient should bring it up because we need to assess, you know, what your periods are like. Are you having still having a period every month? Um, make sure we have that egg quality versus quantity discussion. Uh, if there's any pre-existing medical conditions um, that may or may not require uh, medications, if they do require medications, we need to look at those medications and make sure they're pregnancy compatible. I don't like to say safe or not anymore because we don't even use those, those categorizations. What we should be doing is discussing the risk benefit ratio of each individual medication someone might be on to determine if A, uh, the medication might need to be changed in anticipation of becoming pregnant. Uh, or B, um, that the dosage might be changed or, or, or adjusted. Um, but the reality is, as we approach our 40s, a lot of people are going to start developing medical conditions that need to be treated. Um, mental health, chronic hypertension, diabetes, all those things should be evaluated in a preconception consult. I also think it's a good idea, um, and what the paper showed is potentially getting a cardiac evaluation too, because one of the biggest physiological changes is on the cardiovascular system with pregnancy. And we would want to make sure a baseline EKG looks okay before, you know, getting pregnant, ideally, if we can, uh, or in that age group. Um, and, you know, just having the basic talk with those uh, people in that age group about what pregnancy might look like after age 40, even if you're a healthy person, the risk associated with pregnancy after age 40. Um, being knowledgeable and inform as knowledgeable and informed as possible is, is only going to help. And what are some of those risks of getting pregnant over the age of 40? Well, the first problem or potential uh, barrier is getting pregnant. Um, I think that um, a couple of things that people, as they start approaching that age, uh, I hear a lot, well, uh, my aunt or my mom had a baby at 45, no issues, so I'll be okay and I can do that. Um, or B, if I can't, then I'll just go to IVF. And I think first that people have to understand that fertility is not inherited. You can't assume just because someone in your family was able to successfully and easily conceive for at 40 plus doesn't mean you will. Um, and even and even if you're having regular monthly menstrual cycles, which is the, one of the most important things you need to spontaneously conceive, um, you know, uh, uh, it, it doesn't mean that the, the egg quality is going to be there. I'm a prime example. When I did my five cycles of IVF, I got a bunch of eggs that were chromosomally abnormal. And I was healthy. So that's a thing, something to consider. And then as far as, uh, you know, falling back on, back on IVF as a valid plan B, yes, IVF and multiple things you can do with assisted reproductive technology, but IVF doesn't work for everyone. It didn't work for me. I went through five cycles and I had to actually end up using donor eggs. So we just can't kind of be falsely reassured by those things. Um, we just have to be realistic. And again, be as informed as possible to and make those decisions with as much information as we can. Yeah. And you mentioned getting an EKG for women over 40. Do you think that's for all women over 40 or maybe over 45? So I, th I think, I think uh, if anybody, especially if people have pre-existing medical conditions like hypertension and diabetes, that would be a good idea. Uh, it's not going to hurt to get it on everyone. Do I think that every 40 year old needs to get one? No, but I think it's mostly uh, if anyone's on, you know, has some pre existing medical conditions for sure, I would do that just to make sure that, you know, that looks okay. And if they're, they are long standing, long standing chronic hypertensives and they haven't even had an echo in a while, I would probably get an echo on those patients yeah. um, because, you know, we need to make sure that, that the heart looks okay. Um, so uh, that's kind of where we are with, or what we kind of recommend it in the paper for those that are over age 40. And what are the different strains on the body, the stressors that can happen for someone over 40 who's pregnant? How is that different than, let's say, someone who's 30? Well, I think even when we're not pregnant, we know what our bodies, how our bodies change with age. Uh, I mean, just think about adding the pregnancy on top of that. Um, the physiological changes are there, are pretty much the same. It's just that our bodies might respond a little bit differently, or we as an individual might respond a little bit differently. So um, you know, it's, it's just a matter of making sure that we're at a healthy weight. Uh, if we have chronic medical conditions that we have those under control what, with or without meds, and if they require medications, that's fine. We could still have a successful pregnancy on medications, uh, and making sure we're as, in, we're in as best, best possible health as we can, uh, before even getting pregnant, ideally. Um, the time to play catch up is not 
once the pregnancy is here. Now I know that happens. People have surprise pregnancy. There's not a whole lot you can do about it. But if we have the option to get you under control before the pregnancy, that's what that would be my preference. So the paper mentions assisted reproductive technologies. And, you know, for those people who are listening who don't know what that is, it basically means doing IVF. Do you think every woman over the age of 40 should just go right to seeing an IVF doctor? So there's the science part of me that says yes, <laughs> the science brain, and then the not science brain that says maybe not. So this is what I would say. I would say if you are 40, uh, plus, and you are having regular monthly menstrual cycles, um, you could possibly get away with waiting three months, maybe to conceive on your own spontaneously. And if not, then going, but if you have other medical conditions that could affect your fertility, if you're not having regular monthly menstrual cycles, I would not wait. I would go, I would go right off the bat. If, if for nothing else, just to get a baseline evaluation and get some information from the fertility specialist about what to expect. I mean, I remember when I went with my husband and I'm an OBGYN, I, I told my, my friend who is my fertility doc, I said, talk to us as if I'm not a doctor, just lay it out. And, you know, my husband was just sitting there like, <laughs> you know, and yes, it was daunting. It was scary, but he, you know, he needed, he needed that information. So if, if, if for nothing else, just going and getting that information uh, and that knowledge is going to help. But, um, I would always err after age 40 of being soon sooner than sooner than later. And it does not mean, and I, I say this every chance I get, it doesn't mean if you stamp an IVF on your forehead and say, put you in line for IVF. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of doing some investigation and tweaking things and making recommendations is all that the patient needs, even over 40. Uh, and then there's sometimes that IVF is needed. So don't delay going to an REI doc for an evaluation because of being scared of being told something bad or that they're just going to sign me up for an expensive IVF treatment. Um, the fertility docs are very good about educating and uh, letting people know what their options are. I think for the most part, REIs want to get you pregnant and start your family and uh, your family building in the least invasive and costly way as possible. Uh, that's my experience anyway, and what I, from talking to people. So go sooner than later. Yeah. And the other thing is, especially if you want a larger family and you don't have a baby at home, believe it or not, 40 year olds, you know, can potentially still bank embryos so that they can have two, even three children. And, and just because you did IVF doesn't mean you have to use your embryos right away. I, I tell patients, look, let's just do IVF, freeze an embryo, and then you guys can try it home for a while. It's just nice to know you've you've done some work to give yourself a higher chance of pregnancy in the future. So all great points. What about the first trimester of pregnancy? What do women over 40 need to know about that? So in the first trimester of pregnancy, especially over age 40, uh, there is an increased risk of miscarriage or pregnancy loss, um, and mostly due to chromosomal defects uh, in, in the developing embryo. So, you know, it's a much greater uh, as you get over 40 and then definitely over age 45, the risk of pregnancy loss and the early pregnancy loss is much greater. Um, and the other thing is it's, I, I hear all the time in all age groups, but it's, even in those uh, that are, you know, of an older age, that they don't want to do antenatal screening. And that's where we do draw a blood test to look for an individual's risk of having the, the fetus having a chromosomal defect or something else. And because they'll say, you know, well, I'm not going to, I, I think some people think that if they do that test and it's abnormal, that means they're going to do a termination. And that's simply not true. Mo you know, I highly recommend that anyone, but especially those of an older age or an advancing age, to get the antenatal screening. Because what I see so many times is they decline it, then they come from an ultrasound, and I might see not necessarily a major birth defect, but something that we call minor markers. And these are things that are not birth defects, but can alter an individual's risk of having a fetus with a chromosomal abnormality. And it's so much easier to counsel and make it make sense when I have the results of antenatal screening, um, because it's much easier, it's much more digestible when I can give them a, a, a numbers, you know, what their risk is in numbers. And I, I can't do that as easily when they don't have the antenatal screening. So I highly recommend antenatal screening. It does not mean that if it's abnormal, you're going to terminate, or if it's abnormal that we have to do the amniocentesis, that's always your your choice. Um, so it's it's not going to hurt anything to have those those that information. Um, and, and then early pregnancy dating, getting an ultrasound as soon as possible to get at, uh, accurate dating. The best way to date a pregnancy is not even knowing your last menstrual period. 
that that best way to date of pregnancy is at that early first trimester ultrasound because up to 60% of people, 65 even, are are actually incorrect, are wrong about what their the first day of their last menstrual period was. So getting that early ultrasound is key. Um, and then obviously if the preconception workup was missed because it was a su surprise pregnancy, then the first trimester is going to be a time when we were going to have to do the testing that we need, um, evaluate medical history, any medications you might be on um, to get all that stuff, uh, those things uh, under control and, and uh, in order for the rest, rest of the pregnancy. And what about the second trimester? What do women and providers need to know about that time frame in pregnancy? So the anatomy scan is key, and that's a detailed anatomy scan, and it's typically done at 18 to 22 weeks. I like to do it on the earlier end if I can't, I wear side, meaning 18 to 20 weeks if I can, uh, get the patient in then. And that's where we look again for any major birth defects because patients over age 40 are at increased risk for having birth defects in, the, in their fetus. Um, and then looking for the minor markers, which I described before, so that we can uh, take a good look at the baby. And so people over age 35 and over age 40 are going to have what's called a detailed anatomy scan. And they, I would definitely send the patient for a genetics consult just based on age alone, but especially if there are other things that are going on in the medical history that would warrant a, a genetics consult. And then also you have to think about once you start getting into the second trimester, when the physiological changes in pregnancy are in full swing, you know, the development of diabetes, um, high blood pressure, um, that might be the time when any pre-existing medical condition might start to be a little bit harder to control, or you might need to start adjusting medications or adding medications. So all of those things need to be watched in the second trimester, um, especially in someone that's over age 40. And then the other thing, and I don't want to scare people, but it's it's a reality is stillbirth. Stillbirth is a pregnancy loss after age 40. I'm sorry, after, uh, sorry, I apologize. Pregnancy is, uh, stillbirth is a pregnancy loss after 20 weeks of gestation. And patients over age 40 are at increased risk of stillbirth. So, you know, making sure the patient's informed about that. If there are medical comorbidities that would require antenatal testing, getting that implemented, um, following with growth scans if we need to, or growth ultrasounds to, you know, assess the growth of the fetus. So all of those things are uh, what we need to start considering once we hit the second trimester. And what are your thoughts on a patient having their own blood pressure cuff at home? Is that something that you recommend to your patients? Yeah, I do because, uh, you know, it's it, as long as they had the right size and they know how to do it and they actually do it and they actually log it, <laughs> you know, uh, it, if you're doing it the right way, absolutely. I mean, I think it's, it's a tool. I, I don't want them to get too preoccupied with it. I just tell them a couple of times randomly throughout the day when you think about it, um, you know, you want to get it in different scenarios, you know, not just once they've been sitting down and resting for a while, you want to get it when they're active and when they're also resting so I can get a range of what's going on. So yeah, if your provider recommends that you do at home blood pressure monitoring, um, it's important. The most important thing is making sure the cuff on the blood pressure, pressure machine is the right size because you can get falsely elevated blood pressures if the cup is too small. And what about aspirin? Do you recommend that for your patients over 40? Yeah. So uh, anyone over age 35, that's that's considered moderate risk. So you would need uh, one, you know, two moderate risk or one high risk uh, um, risk factor for being on baby aspirin. But most individuals over age 35 are going to fall into the category where they would start a low dose aspirin for the prevention of preeclampsia. Again, it's for prevention of preeclampsia. A lot of docs just give it to give it. And I don't agree with that. You know, they need to meet the criteria to, to get it, but most advanced maternal age or those over age 35, and especially over age 40, are going to meet criteria to, to start on low-dose aspirin. Yeah. And at what gestational age do you typically have patients stop it? So we continue, th you continue throughout the pregnancy. We don't stop it. Th those are the new recommendations. And what about vaginal delivery? I feel like, you know, I think one of the things my patients want, especially when they've worked so hard to have a baby, I, you know, I always think every delivery is natural, but you hear that term used a lot, but they really want to be able to have a vaginal delivery. What are your recommendations about whether patients should have a vaginal delivery or a C-section? Absolutely vaginal delivery. No question. Unless there's a reason to have a C-section, a pre-existing medical condition. They've had a C-section before and they want to repeat C-section. There's a placenta previa. Patients over age 40 are at increased risk for a placenta previa or a placental abnormality, like a low-lying placenta. Then of course, you're going to need a C-section. But in otherwise, vaginal delivery all the way. Now there is some study, some data that say that there is an increased risk of cesarean delivery and you know what we call a failed labor or a, a, a arrested labor and those over age forty. We don't know why that's there. We haven't figured that out. But if it happens, it happens. But I am 
I hear all the time, my doctor said I have to have a C-section. Absolutely not. If there's a medical reason for it, sure, but not based on age alone. Not based on age alone. We should not be subjecting any individual to a major surgery just based in, in pregnancy, just based on age alone. You got to have other reasons. So I'm um, uh, very pro vaginal delivery. And why do you think that providers in the past recommended C-sections? It's not in the past. They still do. And, and I know they still do. Uh, I, I, they do. And you know who you are. <laughs> um, it's, I, I, I don't, I really, I don't know. Other than then if they are looking at the data that shows that patients have an increased risk of cesarean delivery anyway. But I also, I, and I'm going to back off a little bit. I will also say there's a lot of patients over age 40 who want a C-section and want an elective C-section, um, an elective C-section and or a C-section on maternal request. And I'm for that too. Uh, C-section on maternal request means there's no medical indication for it. You just want it. Um, and if that's the case, you know, after discussing the risk and the benefits and, you know, uh, what the potential complications are, we do it. And I honor that. Um, but, you know, I do think that we should not be making individuals that are older think that they have to have a C-section because that's simply not true. And what kind of trends are you seeing where you're practicing as far as trends in women of an older age delivering babies? Are you noticing any recent trends that you could share with us? I don't. And, and I will say, and I, I, I'm in an academic center, so my patients are 90 plus percent are indigent and underserved. So I, I'll, I don't have a lot of patients that have undergone IVF. Um, so I'm not seeing an uptick because of IVF. I mean, I know nationally that's the case, um, but not in my specific patient population. But, you know, I've, I've seen patients deliver. Someone asked me the other today, actually, what was the, uh, the, uh, the oldest patient I ever saw that got pregnant spontaneously? And I think it was 52. Um, that's not typical though. It's really not. And, um, but you know, I, I deliver patients over age 40 all the time that did, did, uh, conceive spontaneously. Thank you for all your wisdom. And thank you for just shedding light on something that's obviously going to be so important to anyone over the age of 40 to listen to. And, and now that you wrote the article, um, pregnancy after 40 recommendations for counseling, evaluation, and management from preconception to delivery, hopefully more and more doctors will read the paper and just know how we can take better care of women over 40. Is there anything else you want to share with our listeners? Yeah. One other thing that I think it's important is the induction at 39 weeks, that recommendation for those over, over age 40. What do I think? Um, and I am very much for it. I, especially on my patients over age 40, the risk of stillbirth, I think the stat in the paper was a, a 40 plus year old has the is at 39 weeks is equivalent to a 25 year old at 42 weeks. Does that make sense? So the risk is there. And I would highly recommend uh, getting delivered by 39, no later than 40 weeks. I am all for, you know, talking to the patient if they want to keep going, that's fine. And I will do some antenatal surveillance. But by and large, if I if if I had my way, I would like to have those patients delivered um, no later than 40 weeks, ideally at 39. So I do believe the data is strong enough to support that, especially in patients over age 40. Wow. Well, thank you. That's ex incredibly helpful, especially coming from you, so that people can know how to advocate for themselves. And is that recommendation in your paper as well? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, excellent. So people can print the paper, take it to their OBGYNs and say, look, Dr. Clark said so, so it needs to be so. Well, I mean, I, and the other thing is that there's a lot of docs that do do it. And the patient is like, based on age alone, why do I have to? And, and there's, like I said, there's, there's reasons why, but it doesn't mean you have to. It is a recommendation. It, it's elective. That means the patient has to agree. I do not agree or do not ever condone a, a physician scaring a patient into that and saying, it, this is good, but something bad is going to happen or, you know, you should be accepting my recommendation. It's, it's a recommendation and you have to have an exchange and a dialogue and make that decision together. That's called shared decision making. That's what we should be doing as physicians. And some, most of the time, the patients will agree, but that sometimes they don't. And we have to respect that too as long as we're informing them. Well, thank you again, Shannon. I really appreciate all you're doing. And where can people find you? So like you said earlier, I am uh, mostly active on Instagram at babies after 35, but I'm on TikTok for the fun stuff uh, at TikTok baby doc. 
um, those are the main places where you can find me and the website babiesunder35.com. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking time out of your super busy schedule as a professor and mom of your twins to come on here and educator and all the fabulous things you do to talk to us. I hope you'll come back again to talk to us some more. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.